Welcome to our third Stammtisch uh, organized by the MCQST, the Munich Center for Quantum Science and Technology. The topic of today is quantum key distribution, useful or just for fun. Uh, I have uh, very nice guests here around, but first let me uh, tell you about the story behind it. Uh, Stammtisch is uh, in German uh, in Germany, uh, the place where the people meet regularly uh, to have their beer, to talk about what's going on in the village, uh, in the city, in the neighborhood, and uh, more or less to talk about everything, about everybody, of course, as well, and uh, yeah, more or less to have fun there. So, and uh, that's uh, why I have found uh, very nice guests for today. Uh, the first I want to introduce to you is uh, Eleni Diamanti. Uh, she is now at uh, CNRS uh, Research Director in Paris. Uh, she studied uh, physics at the Technical University in Athens and uh, did her PhD in Stanford University. Uh, after uh, Marie Curie at the Institut Optique uh, at uh, Paliso, she, uh, became, uh, she, she got her position at CNRS in 2009 already. Uh, her main research, uh, main research fields are then experimental quantum cryptography, uh, also then other topics like uh, communication complexity, all the many applications thereof. And uh, she's also a member of many EU projects and working there. Uh, to, to get quantum key distribution really live. Uh, next uh, guest, uh, I guess I do it in the uh, uh, age wise, is uh, Christoph Marquardt. Uh, Christoph uh, did his, uh, he studied uh, physics in Erlangen and uh, University of York. Uh, he did then his PhD in Erlangen and uh, after uh, short stays in uh, Denmark and also at the company Zeiss. Uh, he then uh, became a research leader, a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light, uh, where he then is leading the group of, uh, for quantum communication. So his specialities also like uh, for LNE are uh, CVQQT, so it's a, a system where you use uh, continuous variables, the properties of light uh, to uh, make the key distribution. And then he's also very much engaged in uh, also getting the devices running and also then uh, towards uh, satellite QKD and also uh, very much uh, to get really QKD as an application. What's needed there, of course, is also the standardization. So the standardization was also uh, pushed forward a lot by Norbert Lüttenhaus. Uh, Norbert uh, was uh, studying physics in Aachen and uh, Munich actually, uh, and then did his PhD in Strathclyde in uh, Great Britain. Uh, he then uh, did his postdoc in Innsbruck University actually, where we meet, uh, it's really a long time ago, uh, the first time, and then in Helsinki. Uh, and uh, he worked really for uh, one year at one of the very first companies, uh, Magic Q, uh, to, to which, which really had the goal to make uh, quantum technologies uh, a product. But then uh, he uh, came back to a university and uh, with an Eminöte uh, fellowship in Erlangen, from where then he changed to the University of Waterloo in 2006 already as well. Uh, so his specialities are uh, the, the proofs for key distribution to really show that it really works uh, also from the theory wise, what are the, necess the requirements uh, for a secure key distribution. And then also, as I mentioned, uh, to make it really secure, you need all the environment and the definition of the systems uh, and uh, all these efforts for standardization. Then uh, together uh, with uh, Michel Mosca, he founded a, a company um, Evolution Q in Canada, which now already has a branch in uh, Germany as well. Then. Okay, and the last one was uh, is uh, the one who is the long and QPD 
in the field of QKT for the longest time already is Hugo Spinton. Uh, he uh, first uh, studied, what did you write? Uh, he studied uh, climate physics uh, first, uh, but then switched to laser physics for his PhD. Uh, and uh, since a uh, very long time already, more than uh, on, yeah, about uh, 30 years almost now, he's working in the field of quantum key distribution uh, with a lot of contributions from, ranging from protocols to devices uh, to really uh, uh, very nice implementations out of the lab and then also is co-founder of the first uh, company commercializing uh, QKT of IT Quantic. Uh, actually, he's also a very passionate uh, cyclist, what he mentioned then, and for that reason he was uh, also a member of the uh, Geneva um, uh, government. Uh, but uh, for a while, I guess we would need this for Munich as well for some time. <laughs> okay, so this this uh, are now my guests. Very welcome to our Stammtisch. So, uh, host for the first. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, just uh, given our title, I would like to start with the fun. Uh, honestly, my fun is, uh, I had most of the fun always when we moved the uh, experiments out of the lab. So also, of course, when they first worked in the lab, but then that it really uh, gave us the choice, uh, the chance to, to move out of the lab. And I guess, Hugo, you have been the first one already in 2005, uh, 19, sorry, 95. You already did experiments there uh, uh, between Geneva and New York, wasn't it like this? Yeah, indeed. And well, nowadays I wouldn't call it uh, quantum key distribution anymore, no? because it was really very uh, simple experiments. We just sent a, a photon or a photon, a weak pass through the optical fiber, and on the other side we detected it with a single photon detector, and we turned manually the polarization, and on the other side we checked that, that it was still polarized. So that was really very primitive these times, but. Indeed, that was kind of completely fun because we didn't think about application of that really, and it was just, yeah, indeed, uh, amazing sending uh, very weak pulses to installed fiber and be able to detect it on the other side. Indeed, it was just for fun. But but then also later you had the experiments then also more serious experiments uh, between Geneva, New York and Lausanne, I guess. Yeah, that was yeah, indeed. Then there was something which was of course automated system and probably it was not yet secure uh, if you would ask Norbert, no. But uh, it didn't have any finite key analysis or whatever. But it, yeah, indeed, I think it was first serious experiment this was between Geneva and Lausanne in 60 kilometers. Yeah, and I guess that was also the starting point for ID, ID Quantic, wasn't it? Yeah, it was about at the same time, indeed. And uh, actually, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a funny thing, no, you mentioned MagicQ. Uh, and uh, actually, the starting point of ID Quantic was that the, uh, the founder of MagicQ contacted us. He wanted to buy our technology if you want. But this way. And we okay. were a bit skeptical about that. And we said, no, no, so we can do it ourselves, no? And we decided not to to go with him. So MagicQ ex existed before ID Quantic? I didn't know this. Okay. Uh, I I not I'm not quite sure. The, the, what yeah. was his name? Bob Gelfond, no, or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yes. So he That's came to Geneva, and he was interested in this uh, quantum technologies, and he said, "Yeah, you have to, you have to come with me and make a company and uh, for QKD." And mm -hmm. I'm not sure if at this time MagicQ was already founded or not. Maybe, maybe not yet. But then he founded anyway his own company, and he founded ID Quantic. And, 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 and they, they were never really a serious competitor. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know, know. maybe they, sold, they also saw that you, Norbert can tell us, no? Maybe they saw that you were in at some point also. 
but they were, were, were concentrating on buying uh, IP and uh, not really developing themselves. Is there someone Barkun in the background? <laughs> I just wondered whether someone is just doing the house cleaning with the vacuum in the background. It sounds a little bit. <laughs> ah, it could be my computer because it's warming. Okay, I'll mute myself from time to time. It could be my computer. <laughs> Sometimes it does this. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 what about Magic Q then? I mean, um, what, what, what I was impressed, honestly, I mean, compared to ITQ, what I, I guess your first devices was uh, all the optics and so on, but it was still controlled by a computer or so. And you had Perfect. already the optics in this 19 inch rack. Uh, yeah. but, but then ITQ was what I thought uh, was the first uh, to really um, kind of give more this network functionality to the system. Wasn't it like this? Well, I, I mean, the thing is basically, uh, in, indeed, where I, I, I worked as a project leader for Magic Technologies, right, and to, to set up the first commercial device. And I think, uh, indeed, what we were setting up was uh, on a much higher TIA level, right, than, than the con con compared what was actually done than, than otherwise uh, before. And basically, of course, later on, I think we could actually, uh, of course, catch up on that one. But, but in, in, indeed, we had to design the box in such a way that it would really be useful for an end customer. That means you look as well, what are the interfaces? The end customer does not worry, doesn't want to worry about any of the details about it, right? You just want to plug in your data. You want to get either your data in the throughput through that device, or you just want to be able to get your key out. And so you should not worry about anything else. So that is for sure something how we had actually set up that project at that time, yeah. But still, I mean, of course, if you uh, look back right, to uh, what we have today, right, and what, what those beginnings were, there are, of course, quite quite a bit of, of differences, right? And uh, since then, for sure, the whole network aspect, for sure, uh, it really came much, much, much more to the to, to the foreground, right, about uh, what can be done and how it should be done, yeah. And I find it's really amazing to really think about these uh, 30 years or so that, that, that we are working in this field, basically how things are really changed. But, um, I, I remember in, in this, so I, I, I got into that field in 1993, right? So, so I had just completed my, uh, my diploma from, from Munich, from the LMU, and I had been working on general relativity, right? And so things I was just really interested in concepts. And I had just, uh, while, while looking for a PhD position, I just happened to visit Steve Barnett at Strathclyde in Glasgow. And uh, so I was originally thinking I would do quantum optics. So I was looking for quantum optics jobs. And then he just in his office, just, just on the whiteboard, drew down the BB84 protocol, right? So, you know, there's this funny thing over here, right? And then he said, yeah, you know, and then uh, at BBT, right, the uh, friends of mine, they, they, they do stuff, so it was Paul Townsend, right, who, who did some inter, uh, experiments for QQD over there. And they said, yeah, you know, the funny thing is we don't really know there they use laser pulses. What I draw down over here is qubit or single photons. So we don't know, you know, what the security has to do from the other end. And anyway, even for qubits, we don't know what is exactly, what does it mean to be secure, right? What does it mean against the secure whatever it adversary can do? Because remember, that is the time where we did, did not have Nielsen Schwarm, right? <laughs> so we did not have just the, all the standard languages we use today. It was not existing. And, that, and because you asked whether what's fun for me, what's really fun about just to think about this very basic concept where you really don't even know what does it means security. Today, we know, right? We have a security notion today uh, that, that uh, largely actually pushed by Renato Renner forward, right? Uh, but, but we did not have that at that time. And just even to understand basically what is it even that you want to say, right? So this formulation, that's re really amazing. And, and basically we, we have these phases first to understand what does it mean to secure, how to prove it. Then basically go from protocol security, maybe to include something like finite size, right? What is this? And then of course comes the next phase. Okay, good. What about side channels, right? Then we talk about side channels. And then we ask basically uh, uh, then, oh, but do I need dark fiber? Can I do this in parallel? Now we go as well some of these technological questions. Then we try to talk about networks now, right? Can I do active routing through and through networks? And it's really many different phases since the year 
1993 when when I got involved on that. It's really amazing to 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 see how the field all the time changes, right? And recently as well, the thing all protocols that we see the less the loss cadence that it has, and then this great idea from from uh, held by the the Toshiba group of our twin field UKD, where we have very simple setups and the scalings can change, right? So I, I think that's really amazing over this long time, and basically it's really all the time really new new aspects of the game that come forward and change change the field. I find this really fascinating. Yeah, I guess we learned a lot. Eleni, you, you came up with this new protocol then together with uh, starting with uh, Philippe Crochet, I guess, didn't wasn't it? Yes, uh, yes. So so I, I agree with uh, with Norbert and Norbert is mentioning all the topics that we're working on, but these are very recent, right? These are in fact actually very recent. These are the last five years, let's say, that we are really focusing on these particular aspects. But uh, when when I started, so it's a little bit later than you go, <laughs> and so and it's actually it's funny the way I I started working on PPD. Um, when I first started my PhD, the first project that my PhD advisor back at Stanford, Yoshi Yamoto, has given to me was a paper, the KLM paper. You know, the KLM paper is the linear optical quantum computing. And he was like, how about working on this uh, for your PhD? <laughs> and then we came after studying KLM, etc. We decided that it was probably not very feasible mm -hmm. very in a, within a, a PhD, even a long one like in the US. And so we switched the kind of project towards QKD. And I found this very cool because it's much, much easier, right? Quantum cryptography, it's so much easier. It's so much more fun to explain to friends, right? Who, have, who are not scientists. It's the easiest uh, topic in the world to, to convince your friends you're doing very cool stuff. Anyway, so, so, this was, uh, so this is where I came up. And during my PhD, actually, I worked on a different protocol, this differential phase shift QKD protocol, which had come up. Um, right then by our collaborators in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, basically, and the group where I was doing my PhD. And then when I came to France, we started working with Philippe Grandier on continuous variable QKD. And this, this, was, this was pretty cool. So, um, so this is a protocol that comes, uh, as, uh, as everybody knows here, and Christophe, etc., that uh, we're working on this, uh, that, uh, that comes cl very close to, um, to what you see in actual classical optical telecommunications, you can use some of these techniques. Not easy, not easy. Um, it takes us now, we, we, it, it's important to sometimes to, as we're working closer and closer to industry, it becomes more and more important to explain uh, or to optical telecommunication people that it is not sufficient. And this is a general uh, uh, idea about quantum. It's not sufficient to drop, you know, the intensity and to make something quantum. <laughs> so, um, so there is a big, big uh, process, uh, learning process in this uh, in this uh, field. Um, what I find fun is that I, I keep learning. So, for example, now although you know we're supposed now to know very well QKD, etc. Now that I'm working on this uh, on this more uh, practical implementations of this protocol, I keep learning things in signal processing, for example, in electronics that I didn't know before. Right, so or I had done in the university back, back as a student, but I hadn't actually, you know, used them in practice in the lab. So I find this fun. <laughs> it's cool. We keep learning stuff. And, uh, oh, yeah. Christopher, what did you learn last? <laughs> yes, I mean, that, except I, for bureaucracy and so on. I I agree. So um, when when I started many many years ago, Gerd Loix is in, in the master thesis. Um, I already came up with, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, um, I recognized that th th this might be an interesting topic, you know, quantum key distribution. But at that time, uh, 20 years ago, it was still, um, compared to now, of course, on a different level, as we have mentioned many times. So, and then I studied more kind of more fundamental things in, in quantum information and quantum optics. But the fun part is, I mean, all those uh, very fundamental questions, measurement process, um, how do you really define your quantum states and so on, these are very, very important. Also then later on for the very applied um, uh, problems you have in, in, in I mean, uh, nearly, you know, um, commercialized systems and so on. So I think the really interesting and, and, and fun fact about quantum key distribution is that you can actually combine very fundamental quantum physics with you know really nearly product development i would say right and and uh, it's important to do that because i mean we learned 
of course, when we looked at those various you know, practical security issues, quantum hacking and so on, that um, quantum key distribution is <clears throat> not such a thing that you can just give away to your engineering colleagues or so on, right? I mean, it is very, very important to work together with all sorts of interdisciplinary um, experts, you know, the engineers, the ma mathematicians, the computer scientists, which is very interesting because, I mean, you learn a lot, <clears throat> but you really have to work as a team all the time from the start um, to the beginning. And um, <clears throat> up to problems like, um, I mean, nobody said you start with, with, with relativity, right? I mean, if 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 we do um, satellite quantum communication experiments, uh, relativity is is pretty standard. If you have very fast moving satellites, um, if you are very far out there in geostationary orbit, um, you really have to take into account relativistic effects. That's that's bread and butter for all the engineers. They know this and they 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 uh, cope with that regularly. So even even kind of quantum states evolving under relativistic uh, environment um, is, is is something that you have to take into account then at the end for the application and this is this is very interesting yeah, yeah. actually uh, my it's, it's all there with him already as, 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 as you said already i mean i mean my first uh, uh my first contact with quantum key distribution was actually already 91 i almost dare to say it uh, and and uh, what I would say is up to this moment, it was almost dormant anyway. I mean, 84, it was already proposed 84, and then uh, it took this long time uh, until then Bennett and Prasar and the colleagues from IBM uh, really put it into reality themselves. I mean, that was really amazing that uh, perhaps just for the reason that it was published in this uh, proceedings of a, a cryptographer conference. No, no physicist knew about, but then only in 91, then uh, with, I guess, with the Eckert paper in, in Fusreflet. I don't know. Uh, was this also the first time where, where you learned about it in Geneva? Did you have contact before already? I think we learned about it by uh, an article in Scientific American. And it was a, it was a PhD student who, who have seen this and said, ah, Look what they are doing here. And well, you have everything in the lab, you can do it all as well. And then you started to do it. So that was our first thing. So, we, I, of course, I, never, I just arrived at this time in this field. Not for me, it was completely new. And I never heard about Bennett and Brassard before. So the starting point was actually scientific American. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I was at this uh, at a sm very small workshop of uh, one of these very first EU project. I guess it was on squeezed light uh, south of Paris. I mean, I guess it must have been close to Paliso anyway. And uh, actually, Philippe Crochet was there and uh, Elisabeth Jacobino. And then there was also a very young guy. And uh, sometime uh, after lunch, then he explained to me his uh, his paper. And, and then uh, I really, it was really like, uh, my first reaction was, it seems that Heisenberg equa uh, uncertainty relation is really something good for. I mean, that, <laughs> yeah, I mean that that was what I learned there. Actually, it was Arthur Eckert uh, who was also I a, Arthur Eckert. <laughs> uh, and, and who who explained this to me. And but uh, but I mean, uh, coming from more from the foundations, then it was really that uh, <laughs> something which seemed to be the last nuisance in in quantum mechanics, this uncertainty relation, which just makes noise or something like this. Uh, suddenly uh, is something useful and uh, and i guess all this was uh, was what I, I mean up to what norbert mentioned already all this uh, what renato renner and and all the, your colleagues then uh, did in identifying all the entropy properties and how to combine them i guess to something which now i guess is really really secure i mean do we still need more norbert <laughs> We always need more, right? I mean, the, the thing is, basically, I said, basically, for the theory, for sure, it, it can, come, comes a long way, right? Just really, really, the first part thing is really how actually to properly define it. Because intuit intuition is always easy and nice, right? But you need to make it a really stable definition and that it really, in a noisy environment with statistical fluctuations, you can, you can, can, can do all of that one. I think, basically, by now, we, we really have a good handle on, on the, Protocol security. That means if you tell me basically what are your devices, what's the model for your devices, then we know basically 
basically many ways how to do it, but some of them are really nice from the inside, right? Entropic uncertain relations are really great. And, and the other tools we really understood a lot, but uh, I think basically what we're really grappling on is, is now really this uh, uh, step over to protocol security, which is now a completely different kind of, of beast, right? Protocol security means really I want to talk about the security of an actual device. And so protocol security, on the other hand, just talks basically about uh, uh, security of a model of a device. And so we know, of course, uh, model and devices, there are a gap between them, right? No matter how, how, how detailed your, your model is, there will be always a gap. Right? Uh, and so I think basically there we see already one of the big challenges is for us to understand as well and as well to communicate even within our uh, community of people doing QKD about what is actually the security claim of QKD for a protocol and for implementation. For implementation, you cannot say it's unconditionally secure, right? That it does not work. For protocol security, I can, right? Because it's it, it's a technical term. But now how to understand with, with the deviations, right? How to deal with deviation, how to characterize them, right? And I mean, it's very hard to, since, since you have been working on these characterizations of of deviations, right? Basically, how to take them best into account and really to, to get something really smarter out there. I mean, we know there's always this, uh, uh, the area of as well of device independent QKD, which can drastically reduce assumptions that we need to make. Basically, that's one way, reduce assumption, right? And then those things that you can't reduce at least uh, may make better modeling in there. But in that area, there's still lots to do with the same as, as in finite size effects. Yes, we have finite size uh, proof for, uh, for, for finite size QKD, but those we don't believe to be tight yet. Right? For asymptotic security proofs, uh, for protocols, we have basically, we, we know, we can calculate the, the best key rate, no problem. Finite size, there are so many inequalities we are using, we might actually throw away more key than necessary in the process. And there's a lot to be discovered over there. Right? Which is obviously the other thing that people don't say, oh, you're working since 30 years in QKD, you're still not done? <laughs> no, <laughs> guys. <laughs> the, basically, the questions really, as we go more and more detailed, they are really questions which are as well interesting really on a fundamental level. So it's not only that it's, a, oh, it's just getting engineering, some detail, whatever, more time to work. No, we need to understand how you can, can grab it. Yes, there's more to be done. Do we need more protocols? I mean, I mean, actually here in the moment, we are uh, two by two or something like this with CVQKD and DVQKD. Uh, I mean, what about to fight for it or do we, do we co uh, aim for coexistence? <laughs> but, but I, I would say for, for, for sure we, we need uh, as well more protocols because then there's not like the best protocol does not exist. It always depends about what you want to do, right? Uh, for example, if you want to bring the price down is, is one thing. If you want to go basically uh, uh, highly loss tolerant, right? Like uh, what, what Christoph is very interested in to, to go from geostationary satellites down and so on. So there are many different things what means good, right? What is your, your metric? And there will be uh, di different ways how to do it. Or if you want to integrate it in, into existing infrastructure, right? Then it's, it's, it's the engineering aspect comes into the game. How different is, how easy is it to build? How easy is it to integrate? Uh, but, but I mean, the thing is really, uh, uh, we have things like, uh, 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 the twin field QKD, which I think is really one of those things with uh, something which should, looks very simple. I, of course, we know all experimentally, nothing is as easy as it's written down, right? <laughs> but, but something at least it looks simple from the idea. And the question can we scale this up? Are there more ideas like that one about? I mean, that's for sure something that uh, uh, we still need and should search for, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I agree. I mean, I, th I mean, in all those sorts of protocols, there's always pro and cons, and you really have to use them and 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 know where the pro and cons are, um, and not only the different protocols, but I mean, there's of course also so many flavors of one protocol, different degrees of freedoms with uh, also um, kind of uh, different use cases where you can use them, and uh, I think it it is really worth if you look at the practical problems. Um, to investigate all those different possibilities, um, because at the at the end, as as Norbert has said, I mean, at the end you have a customer or or someone using it, and it might be us in ten years or so that at home we have fiber to the home, and then we have some I don't know router that can help us with some secure enclave to secure our banking transitions or whatever. Um, 
and uh, this is a different use case than uh, a satellite connection where you have completely different parameters that you have to cover. Um, so I think that that's very important. And also, um, how do you convince the people that actually what you do and what you build is secure, right? I mean, so disclaimer, I'm also a co-founder of the company Kikwant, so <laughs> yet another company <laughs> around. Oh, um, so, um, and, and, and there, of course, you have the problem. How do you convince someone that actually the device that you build um, is, is to be trusted? Because at the end, it's all great boxes. Yeah, and as you said, Norbert, it can help if you have different protocols like those device independent protocols, may, maybe partly device independent protocols. Um, uh, but at the end, you always have to trust the gray box and you have to trust all the computers inside and so on. So um, to find a good way um, how to have simple protocols, uh, simple modeling, simple um, um, uh, description of the complete device, um, I think there's there's many things to do. I don't think I just uh, that the technologies are enemies. We should see them as complementary. The protocol is complemented. I know it's maybe a bit of an idealistic view, but this is really, 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 honestly how I see it. I do not see them as enemies, or uh, or uh, I think, and this is actually the community how it's structured right now. The QKD community in Europe, at least, it's we're working together. I think towards uh, with all these protocols to working together towards the same goal of making them exactly like crystal said um adapted the best uh, possibly the well uh, adapted to different use cases to make them uh, like increase their performance their security achieve the same goals um like standardization etc so I, I honestly do not see them as competing there is obviously pros and cons exactly like crystal said but uh, i mean in the end uh, you want to show that they are interoperable that they can actually function together in in a network and they can be used uh, for this or that um, use case in the end. I, I agree. I mean, we are not yet in a situation that we have a competition between the companies. The, the technology is not yet established, so all companies contribute to to fight and make it uh, accepted uh, solution. And uh, so it's really stupid if you would like to think about competition between companies or different approaches. And I, I hope that we have new protocols no, are coming up because uh, that's an interesting thing for physicists. No, the other thing is more for electronics engineers and whatever. So I think we, not for me, no, but for the young people, <laughs> hopefully there will come new, new protocols up and they have fun with new things, with simple experiments and then um, have new ideas. Yeah, but also I must say I still um, I have an issue with Charlie Venice. If Charlie hears this one, I think you know he could have done. I, it, it was not a nice idea to directly come up with the BBAT4 protocol, right? <laughs> because it, it's so good, right? I mean, they should really kind of come up with some some protocol which somehow does it, but it's really in a way a bad idea. And instead, they came up with this protocol which just survives all the time. I think that was not nice. It was not nice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, fortunately, it needed a few add-ons to make it simple. But I guess especially just decoy stuff so that we really don't need single photon sources. That was very appealing to me. I mean, to, to really make make the systems simpler and simpler, I guess. That's, that helped a lot. But I mean, then the, for me, there's always this race uh, between uh, this very, very high weight and long distance and or then uh, some very simple systems. I'm more on the simple side, actually. Uh, which we, what my idea would be always to integrate it seamlessly into any other communication system. Uh, so, so I don't know what. What do you think should the development go to, or is it again just coexistence because we need both of them? I always think all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> High rate. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, if if you think about basically use case, basically if you want. Uh, on, on one hand, I would really expect we, we have uh, uh, securing the telecommunication infrastructure, right? So you have backbone with huge data load. There you need just rate, right? You really need to, to find ways how to get lots of, of, of rate in there. It's clear QKD rate will be always be below, by orders of magnitude below, the classical communication rate that they can do over fiber, right? 
But, but do we need this? Stuff. Do we need this? I mean, Hugo, Hugo, what, what do your customers say? Uh, or the IT Quantic customers? I mean, do they want great or, or simplicity? They want, I think they want simplicity and not pay too much for this added value of, of a quantum security. And for the time being, as far as I know, nobody uses QKD to encrypt with one time time. And uh, as long as you don't use one time pad, rates is maybe not that important. No? But what's, what's much more important that you have a, a simple system which integrated the, integrates a smart key management and it's kind of fire and forget. No? The, the, the guys who buy it, they install that and then they have a solution and they don't want to think about what should I do, renew the key again, or, or all these things. I think that's probably the most important. Thing. But isn't this a little chicken and egg? I mean that that I, I mean nobody uses one time pad because we don't have the rates and vice versa. Uh, well I'm not well not not necessary. The thing is of course you could use one time but we have decent rates, let's say ten megabit per second, no? Mm -hmm. But then a 10 megabit per second is already a, a very reasonable rate, and it's probably enough to, to encrypt all the uh, important messages we have. But uh, the users don't want to change all the, the infrastructure to have a separate channel for 10 megabit per second. They, will, well, they want to have their Ethernet connections, and, and they want just to have a, in between a, a box which encrypts and decrypts. And, uh, and and that's actually a problem. And, and I don't understand all these uh, issues with these protocols of uh, Ethernet and all these different protocols. But at, at some point, we wanted to implement one time path. And we found out it was very, very complicated. Because in the Ethernet protocol, you have everything. You have error correction. If, if a block gets lost, it, it's, a, it's, it's automatically you send it again and all these things. If you want to make implement a one-time pad in the same way, in a robust way, it's a headache. And we discussed some time with, with specialists on that and we gave it up. Because it's okay, it's not our business, it's too complicated for us. And it's not so easy to implement a one-time pad in an environment as we know it, no? So that's, I think that's the other reason why it's not implemented yet. It's too complicated. That's a surprise to me now. I mean, so so one time pad I thought would be the simplest encoding anyway. No, but yeah, in some way, yes. But uh, if you look a bit how this in internet protocol and all these things work with these blocks they send and, yeah. and all these things, yeah. apparently it's not so easy. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand enough the detail. Not big, uh, the only thing I understood it's it was it's really not not so easy and that's what i think the reason nobody implemented it yet but, but I, I think the other thing is really to keep in mind as well is of course the field is developing right i mean uh, basically uh, we have to ask basically on one hand basically what's the situation today and what will be the situation uh, uh, like in 10 years i mean for that one as well i mean you can just go back i mean when i started for magic in the year 2000 right and we were developing our QVD project. So I was as well basically calling to customers, right, to, to beat up some customers. And basically, I got laughed out of the room because people just thought, you don't have a problem, right? You want to set us a, a solution to something, you don't have a problem, not at all. And I mean, the thing is basically, today the situation has changed, right? So basically, today everyone accepts that we need to be quantum safe. Now, but still, today people uh, will not really necessarily employ directly, write the check and install and secure all the system QKD based. They are now basically in the face about saying, okay, what do we do about that problem? Right? And there's a thing do I go with post quantum? Do I do with QKD? What can those things do? And then for many of the things that Hugo mentioned as well, uh, we really, the infrastructure needs to be ready to, to A, to do post quantum. Uh, encryption, but as well to accept uh, keys for one time pad uh, uh, encryption or uh, just to do anyway to do symmetric key into uh, cryptographic infrastructure. So we are in the process as well to change the system and basically there was a question about what does the customer want today and what do you need today might be very different from in what is in 10 years. So we have on one hand basically the vision process where we have to design future 
security infrastructure and what it looks like. And I think that is really where all these uh, uh, Euro QCI, QNET and uh, activities are working, but to look ahead. And then we have basically to find as well the way how to transition it. Right? Some transition processes are already basically on its way. So and that's basically for the standardization part indeed just in key management. Where there's, this has nothing, no quantum aspect to it whatsoever. But really to work on, on, on key management aspects to say basically how do I distribute key, how do I use key in, 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 in the future. And that needs to, uh, that will develop. And that's as well why I say how it will be used in the future will really depend as well on the balance between post-quantum and QKD. There are two very different approaches. Right? They have different security statements, they will have different application ranges because they have different constraints as well. And we need to figure out how they all of that fits together. Right? And then we will as well see, and I'm sure that basically in the future infrastructure, we need, we need both of them. But this will as well will drive the demand about in which form UKD devices we need. Right? So that's really hard for what you asked earlier. Right? So is it a, a cheaper devices? Basically, if you think about, do we want to secure IoT devices? Well, probably not exactly, right? So we don't go like what we wireless connectivity that we have, but how far can you push it? Right? Can I push it into in, into as a, a card in, into laptops, right? Or do I have to go into only to a building with a big UKD box there? And and all of that depends as well, of course, what technology is available and at what price. And all of that are just, uh, uh, none of them are fundamental questions and limits. It's just practical things that will change over time. And we don't know where and how it changes. That's as well why it's important to drive it forward in all fronts, right? Because we don't know, un unless we push, right? We don't know how far we can go. The, the problem is that I find that Norbert is that sometimes, although as you're saying, the technology is advancing and the needs advance, right? But the problem is that setting up uh, cybersecurity solutions and security infrastructure actually takes a lot of time, right? So mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a long uh, it's a, it's a long procedure, and so if um, if people, if customers or businesses don't feel the urgency today to do something, you know, and they are like, they are convinced by post-quantum solutions and they find QKD solutions too expensive or too, let's say, too, too difficult to understand in the end. They don't even know if they really need them or not. They will go for the easiest path, let's say, and then, and then it's difficult to, to get them uh, to use a technology that if they had uh, anticipated from the beginning, it would have actually been much more useful. So maybe what you wanted to say is that if we manage to get the technology much cheaper and much um, easier to integrate uh, in five years, then it won't be too late that people can integrate it. But um, I find that there is a little bit of a time, you know, a time yeah. issue sometimes in adopting a new technology. That's why I think it's important to convince uh, businesses, and I think it's true, that they need to, to to consider this technology from now. But, but the thing is indeed, uh, uh, the good thing is we see, of course, that indeed customers are exploring that one, right, in SVL QKD networks and solutions, right, and mm -hmm. that's just to see what it can do, and I think they are aware of what they, that basically over time it can change, but they want at least to see that now already, what can could I do now already, and just to understand basically as well, what are the differences between QKD and post-quantum, for example? And I mean, that's of course very important as well for our messaging, right? I mean, so that's uh, uh, really to make sure that people don't think that QKD and post-quantum are interchangeable. They are not, right? And and so that is something that, which is really important. And that's where I say as well, QKD might, for example, find its use as well in the backbone of, of inf uh, telecommunication infrastructures. But we really have to figure out basically what to do about the last mile, right? Uh, and, and, and things like that, but but that means we have to work with the, how they interplay with them and find these the solutions so that we can find, find as well the, the convincing arguments and the convincing architectures that combines those two that we really have the advantage, but together with the right message. But you're, you're right, there's obviously psychology of it is, is part of the game, right? That is absolutely the case, right? So, so you cannot, you can, we can have the smartest whatever argument, but if there's a psychology thing that, that just goes the other way around, then sorry, you lost, <laughs> right? Uh, just, just to to make this clear, I mean, post quantum is a uh, in, uh, includes all the conventional algorithms now, which have been designed uh, to be 
robust against attacks with a quantum computer. So, so it's again another algorithm uh, compared to the RSA algorithm, what we are using in all the browsers on the internet, et cetera, et cetera, which are not secure anymore. And uh, you say we should distinguish it from QKT because right, uh, it's a different level of security. Yeah, and, and that is basically, for sure, basically post-quantum is the approach we, we try to recover what we had before we discovered that quantum computers are bad for RSA, right? So that's basically try to go there. But on the other hand, basically, I think there's this very growing uneasiness in, in uh, for cryptographers as well. I mean, what, where there are really so good times. Yeah, I mean, you can go back and you see, of course, that there is progress as well in classical ways, how, how to, to uh, factor large numbers, not in the way, dramatic way like a quantum computer would be doing, but they are actually progress. And I mean, there, there, there is this uh, tutorial by Johannes Buchmann for the QCrep from a few years back, which actually uh, shows that one a little bit and, and, and highlights that stuff. So I think that's basically something, uh, basically, once you go post quantum, you still always have to estimate the computation power available to, uh, to an adversary, right? You have to do all that stuff still, right? Uh, and basically, uh, in, in QKD, the idea is basically once I do QKD, then I'm done with it, right? So, so that means I'm not worried about future technological developments. Whatever I do today, encryption will stay secure in the future as well, right? And so th that is an aspect which is important, of course, uh, not for everything, but for some things that might be very important really for all information that is really has long-term confidentiality, right? Uh, and and, and, and uh, I think typically cryptographers would not uh, make any statement about security of a classical uh, a protocol with like recommended key lengths and so on. It's a time horizon for anything than we say 20, 30 years, right? But we know secrets that need to be protected for longer. So what do we do all of that? And yes, QKD has drawbacks. It's physically based, right? It's not, I cannot just do a software implementation of do it. So obviously it's different. It has, has the limitations of, of, of length because of the loss scaling. So I have to work more on, on it. And of course, there are also future solution, quantum computer, quantum networks that will eventually overcome it, right? But if I talk now about the, 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 the foreseeable future, as, as, as this technology is not available yet. And so, yes, therefore they are different. That's what I say, because uh, it's not one replacing the other. QKD does not replace all these nice features that probably key crypto has, digital signature and so on, which is actually the 90% or so on of the actual crypto that we use is not encryption. So, right? so on this point, I would say, on this point, I would say that there is a little bit of historic, um, uh, historic uh, the, the, um, harm that was done in the beginning of the field. Um, where uh, and and that is a little bit of a pity <laughs> that I think it kind of carried on uh, um, this um, uh, let's say uh, not competition but this maybe animosity I don't know this uh, aggressivity between the conventional and quantum cryptography exactly because as you said what you said uh, Norbert it wasn't really said that in the end it shouldn't be understood as something that replaces the whole of the classical cryptographic uh, infrastructure and uh, and and techniques but comes to complement it in a in a useful way for certain tasks but it wasn't it wasn't presented like that mostly by physicists it's a bit our fault as well i would say and so and so this i think created that we're starting right now right to getting out of uh, of um, of this idea and now generation let's say of of qkd uh, of crypto quantum cryptographies were fully comfortable with the idea of that the the combination of these techniques is is the optimal either way to go but it wasn't like that in the beginning right so uh, yeah. Yeah, and but, but, but I think it's really this important thing me message for that one is really as, as we basically educate basically the, the new talent uh, in, in our field that it should be really mandatory that that everyone working in QKD actually knows about what is post quantum. They know as should as well know what is exactly exact uh, um, uh, security claim of QKD and what is it not. Right, so so all of those things, and really to say basically like you know what is the authentication requirement in QKD, or uh, uh, what is the authentication requirement in post quantum, right? It, it is good to have this kind of of of, of a really basic uh, uh, understanding, really of all those cryptographic aspects, really in that. I mean, we have here in in Waterloo, we have actually a program. Uh, uh, they said Mike Mosca actually set up CryptoWorks Twenty One, which is actually designed for students from for mathematics, computer science, of and physics, and so it really makes sure that 
all people get a basic education, not only in their own field in cryptography, but as well in the, all the other cryptographic aspects. And I think that is very important because it's as well important if, if our students go out and give presentations, they don't fall back in this very simplistic language, right? That, that, that use for, was used for, for, for a while and which really antagonizes indeed. Is, is a and this simplistic language, it's funny because this simplistic language, I hear it from colleagues in quantum technologies, who, who present, I hear them talking, who are a bit farther away from the QKD actually as it is today than us. And so they use this very simplistic language about doing uh, very often, uh, I hear that. So we need to educate not only the students, but our colleagues. <laughs> yes. So yes. this is, is actually pretty interesting. I, I agree. And, and, and what, uh, what I found very interesting is also when we, you know, talk to classical cryptographers or even the security agencies, right? Um, uh, often there's a problem with language, of course, because it's different fields, and it's it's really sometimes a it's a little bit like clash of cultures if you if you are working in, uh, between different fields. You know, the computer scientists, they, and even among the computer scientists and cryptographers, there's different fields and disciplines which have have a problem talking to each other. I learned right, so uh, and and this is of course to be understood and. And what really helped is talking. And uh, sometimes you find that after hours and hours, and I guess you all know this, of talking in workshops, um, you suddenly recognize that the very simple things had not been understand, uh, understood mutually, right? And then if, if this happens, then everyone uh, uh, agrees that, oh, actually, there is no problem. It's just different language, right? So So this is also something that 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 we then in in those initiatives like like Euro QCI or so on, when there are all those meetings and 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 one is discussing about architecture and so on, which is very good because I mean this is the exercise we have to do, and it's very important that you have uh, participants from different fields and different backgrounds from from end customers uh, from from engineers from computer science from mathematics security agencies and so on, and uh, you spend a lot of time first just defining the terminology so that you have a common understanding. Um, and I think that that is very important. And as you said, uh, Norbert and Eleni, it's also very important to, uh, to put this into education from, from the start. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, before it was already mentioned, I mean, there was uh, infrastructure brought up I mean, now there is this huge infrastructure already established in China with a link between Beijing and uh, Shanghai. And I guess they even want to expand this even down to Hong Kong. I mean, do we in Europe ever see something similar, do you think? I mean, or how long will this take? I mean, you are working, some of you are working on this Euro QCI or towards it. So, so what do you think about uh, these projects in Europe compared to what is done already in China. I'm not in Europe. Oh, I, 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 oh, I, I, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. excuse. You do a lot of work it's for the French, uh, the French German axis, and it just to speak then. <laughs> <laughs> and so yes, um, I mean yes, I think uh, of course we are going to do it in Europe. <laughs> of course we are working on it, right? We are working on it. There is so many test beds um, in in different European cities that are being built, including Geneva, <laughs> that uh, that are being uh, are in the process of being developed right now, where we are. Um, we're testing all these technologies and we're doing exactly what Christoph said. We are discussing between with people that we were not discussing with previously, right? Engineers, telecom engineers, equipment providers, all sorts of uh, different uh, different expertise that uh, we didn't know. And it's, uh, um, and it's actually extremely instructive. So what's going to happen, I think, in Europe, it's even, it's, it's even more ambitious than what is happening now in China, although, I mean, probably China is also looking to, um, to go towards uh, next generation quantum networks uh, as well. Um, so I think we're going to, here we're going to focus quite a bit on testing different technologies, right? I think I believe if I'm not wrong, that uh, in uh, in China, uh, I think there is uh, 
basically is uh, mostly one a single KKD protocol that is being tested. So I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's nice that there is a diversity of systems and of protocols and of systems in Europe. I think we're going to learn some things from, from this. And, um, and a big variety of use cases as well. So I guess we're going a little bit more progressively. We're not, we're not there yet where we can build the backbone of 2000 kilometers and then, uh, but it's very nice to see it happening. Huh? Obviously, huh? it's an extremely ambitious project and we're, we're working towards satellite um, connections as well, but we do not have yet a satellite like Missus on uh, on uh, on board. But uh, yeah, I guess in Europe things are uh, a bit more progressive, but I think we're going in the right direction. What do you think, Christophe? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and the interesting thing, I think, to compare with China, maybe China is a bit more centralized, the approach that is taken naturally. Um, in Europe, of course, kind of the, the, the challenging thing is that we have many different national states. And if, if you know about real security systems, uh, then, of course, uh, security is, is, is very much a national aspect about the security agencies and so on still. There's, there's also European uh, initiatives there, but th that's still an aspect. Now, that makes it, of course, a bit harder to consolidate all these uh, different also political issues. Um, uh, on the other hand, it's also interesting because we are forced, looking at the architecture, to cope with that, to say, OK, there's different there's different domains that have to be, you know, with different trust levels, you know, but you have to connect those domains and you have to make those interfaces and so on. How to design the architecture? And so now this forces us to also come up with architectures that are, that are maybe a bit more versatile and 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 open to different connections, maybe also to further connections later on outside Europe. And uh, so I think um, uh, that's that's both a challenge, but also it's very good to come up with uh, very nice solutions. Yeah, to me, it was really amazing. Recently, we had this review meeting from the OpenQQD EU project and I mean, I was really surprised about this huge number of different uh, use cases which have been already implemented partially. I guess you had uh, a few of them have been in Geneva as well, it wasn't there as well? So, so it's really amazing uh, how widespread one really can use uh, QKD if, in, if one just thinks about it. Well, maybe something which is a bit different on these use cases are still local use cases. So, uh, I don't know, a company has a, a link and, or some application of secret sharing or something like this. And for me, the question is a little bit if this, you have this European-wide quantum infrastructure, which is still with trusted repeaters, of course, uh, is there, are there use cases at this scale? No? So, it means that actually Germany has obviously trust friends and this is a versa, no? And uh, I'm not quite sure about that, no? So that's the difference to China. China, of course, they, the whole link is controlled by China and the trusted repeater uh, scenario makes completely a sense there because anyway, the state uh, supervises everything and all the banks use this link and they don't care if the state knows what they send information is sending. In Europe, I'm not sure about this. No? I'm not sure if a Swiss bank would use a European link to London to send some data, probably not, no? And uh, so that's that's maybe a, a bit a different thing, no? But so I'm not, not convinced that this is really a application now in, for QKD. It's but there are locally with short on short distance, there's still a lot already a lot of applications you can exploit. Yeah, I think that these are very good questions because at the end, it's all about about the trust relationship. Right. I mean, um, when you talked about trusted nodes and so on, but um, even even if you talk about authentication processes, because I mean, uh, QKD of course has to authenticate at the beginning, um, and that is also a very big topic. How should you structure that? How how do you build this chain of trust? Right. It's 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 not this asymmetric public key infrastructure that you could use, uh, you know, in those public key um, systems that that are often used now. So um, these are questions that are very important because this, this, if you if you solve those questions, it will make the systems versatile, and and then you can cope with all those different architectural choices. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Let's see how well this proceeds. We'll be curious about this. Uh, no, but I think Uko is right, right? I think Uko is right that uh, we have to see, I think there is a different category of use cases in local uh, metropolitan and metropolitan networks and long long distance ones, right? They're a bit discreet and they are. Uh, they, they will need the kind of uh, technologies that will rely, they we're a bit further away technologically from going to long distance ones. And this is perfectly okay. For me, there is no problem. It's from the minute that we have identified the good use cases and what are the good technologies for them, that's, um, that's fine. So I don't see this as a problem. I see it as progressively moving from the use cases that make sense on the local and metropolitan scale, and then moving um, further away in time in the in the long distance uh, regime with trusted or with less trusted and trusted nodes. We just that's why it's important to to invest heavily in uh, in next generation technology as well, like satellites and quantum repeaters and this type of technology. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think as far as addition, not, it's not only about the distances to, to make the, the distinction between metropolitan and long haul, but it's as well as a question basically is it the network where operator and, uh, and user are the same person? They basically trusted nodes uh, are, are okay because you trust your own equipment, you can secure it, or you go into a service provider model, right? Uh, where basically no, now the user has to trust the service provider. And in, in this question, depending on for the use case, it might be acceptable or not acceptable, right? So, so, so there are many different various aspects of it. And I think that Estelle explains why it's basically first said, oh, people say, oh, why, where's the use case for QQD? Exactly. Well, there are so many scenarios, right? That you really have to see basically in which case can I do what? Where's authentication and easy or a problem where it's not a problem and so on. Right. And, but, but uh, I think especially around this authentication, there's of course quite often, a discussion where you really have to say that you really need to understand what, what is about. I mean, the, the interesting thing about QKD is that authentication is something which needs to be secure only the moment I generate the key before I accept it. The, the authentication scheme can be broken any second thereafter, and I don't care. Right? And so, so therefore, this initialization is, is not always only to say, oh, I can use a symmetric key authentication, then I have a secret key anyway. So, you know, why, what's the point, basically? But I need to do this this key once to kickstart it. And after that, basically, the system runs and, and generates a new key. Or I can use very different time scales, right? I could, could can imagine to use a public key uh, authentication today, right? If uh, uh, if I'm sure, but it, 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 as long as I'm convinced it has not been broken by the time that I'm using it the first time, Right, and I can use it because I mean, if it's broken in the future, the same scheme, I don't care. It's too late, right? It's uh, for, for the adversary. But, but all of those have nuances, and basically, we need to be aware. Of course, if we look, for example, in the alternative and post quantum, and this, or even today's infrastructure, there's a lot of trust structure there as well. I mean, it, it's not like basically uh, uh, those problems or these considerations do not exist. In, 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 in today's uh, uh, cryptographic industry. They exist as well, and we need to figure out what are their the trust assumptions compared to what we do now. But right? you really need to understand all of this system, which I really think is really is an important thing as well as, as, uh, as you, you all said before, it's a very important to work interdisciplinary. We need to have the interaction with, with uh, people work that work on today's uh, uh, um, security infrastructure, how are things done there, and really to un understand to come to the bottom of it, right? What is the challenge? What are not the challenges? Where, where do we solutions that we can just take over? Uh, where is something where, where they are not sufficient in the future, right? So there are lots of interesting questions over there, but we really need to work together, right? To, to get the different expertise in this as the solution uh, proposals there. Yeah. May I come back to fun stuff? <laughs> yeah. What Always. would you have? been working on now if you wouldn't have turned to quantum physics? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Hugo, you started with climate physics. I mean, that's, of course, now the big thing anyway. You would yeah, have well, indeed, indeed, sometimes I regret a bit that I, I left this field. And this is, was also a motivation for my political engagement to compensate for that, no? Because QKD is maybe fun, but we will not save the world with QKD, no? So it's pretty useless in this sense. And so that's something uh, 
which I, I'm happy to, at some point, to do something else. And uh, yeah, so it, maybe it's a bit to regret sometimes. But but anyway, you know, it's whatever you do, uh, as long as it's uh, it's enough fun, then you, you can go on. Huh? Eleni, what has been your second choice? It's a very good question. So I liked a lot uh, robotics and astronomy. So I think I would have worked on perseverance. <laughs> so uh, this uh, on the on the missions, uh, which is even more useless if you want to go. <laughs> but I find it fascinating. I think this is what I would have done. <laughs> and you others? So yeah, actually, for, for, for me, it was nearly medical doctor. Um, and now the fun thing is if, if you if you go if you dive a bit deeper deep into into medical into medicine, you find that you know, so many things, so many are, things unclear are unclear in medicine. In medicine. So, compared so compared to physics, to physics I mean they don't they know don't much know about much. how things really how things work. Really work. Um, so uh, I think so that I think that's think also that's some some of those fields where a lot of surprises can still be and a lot of things can be discovered. And um, and again, um, uh, quantum quantum mechanics is very versatile. So, um, if you know, if if one finds some sensing mechanisms which is a bit more sensitive or so on, uh, maybe one can also combine this a little bit. And in theory, Norbert, what would have been there your second choice? Well, I mean, the thing is basically, I, I, as I have, yeah, yeah, I have done relativity. The thing is basically, as an undergraduate student, I like general relativity and I basically did laser, laser physics, quantum optics. And I liked both. And then basically, I decided to do just one after the other. And I decided to do the, these as, as a second subject that, that might actually give me a job because relativity, general relativity typically tends not to give you a job. But uh, because for me, it's obviously really the interesting is the conceptual thinking, right? How to find concepts and stuff. But I mean, there was one thing indeed, uh, which was basically to say, basically, what would I do basically in, in thinking about what is useful? And that's interesting that uh, during the time that, that was when I was looking around as well, what to do. And as I sometimes, as usually, all of us, many of us probably came at the point where there was a question, can I stay in academia or not? What else would I do? Uh, and uh, I remember that I was visiting the UK and there was a, a TV show, at, at that moment, it's a documentary. And that was really the issues about uh, 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 in, in medicine, basically how to help basically to cover uh, uh, gaps in nerves, right? So it means if, if, if people are quadriplectic and uh, really to, to say basically in the event, it's, it's this very strange thing, right? There's a nerve comes to a point and it's interrupted and the nerve is completely fine on the rest. And really, how to basically just gap this bridge, which makes such a big difference, right? And as, as we know, basically, there has been progress being on, in, in, in this area. And there you just have to figure out, you know, what, how can you do that one? How do you decipher actually what is the mechanism that you could artificially insert to, to bridge this gap? This is one of the things which uh, I noticed actually a few times, which I thought basically that is something if I could have solved and contributed to 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 uh, solving a problem, that probably would have been it. Which is very different from what I'm doing today, indeed. And you, that, Harald? Uh, yeah, that's really surprising now because I mean I also was uh, absolutely fascinated from neurology and so on and all this. Uh, uh, it's almost like uh, Christoph and Norbert now. Uh, but uh, honestly, I mean what I then I got, uh, got really more attracted to is that physics is much more clean to me, at least. Yeah. I mean, all these dirt effects. Uh, and that's exactly. most likely also why at the end I ended up with uh, atom optics or, or with photonics, uh, because that's uh, even much better than any solid state physics and so on. <laughs> Honestly, it's, everything is much better under control. So all the atoms are the same as long as they don't form a crystal with lots of impurities in and so on. So, so that's, that's quite nice to me, for me, actually. And uh, that's the reason why I ended up there. But for the neurology, actually, I, I found it very fascinating that now uh, optogenetics turns out uh, to be a nice tool uh, to, to study all this, uh, new, uh, all this uh, yeah, conductivity and so all the dependencies in the nerves because so, so optogenetics is really just you bring in something which fluoresces depending on the current, etc., which uh, comes along. 
so so at the end we would <laughs> work with optics again perhaps yes okay. well, <laughs> somehow actually uh should we ask for questions whether there are already some around anka and tatiana Uh, yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes. There are two questions. So the first one is uh, the internet relies on packet switching to connect billions of computers without direct electrical connections. Will we have to go back to the 19th century telephone exchanges to do QKD at scale? <laughs> well, I would say basically I, I mean, even today we have basically uh, the internet is done with telephone exchanges, right? It's only done electronically. We don't see it. There's no person sitting doing this connection like that. But of course, there's an automatic mechanism doing it. So what's the difference, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 uh, routing uh, basically is 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 always be, being done. So I I think. Uh, again, QKD is not directly in competition with everything the internet is doing today, right? So, so we, we just need to look what's going, but as well to look basically what is that in deep down we are using today anyway. Maybe it's important to clarify as well that there are different topologies and architectures, right? And so it's not necessary to have a fully connected network with every user being connected to every single other user to perform QKD because I think maybe the the account because we're doing often point-to-point -point QKD, there might be this confusion that we need everybody to be connected with everyone. So I think this is why we're talking about topologies and architectures, that this is totally possible to have backbone structures and access networks and ways of uh, um, distributing the keys without uh, having direct connections between every single user, the other ones. I think this is important to clarify this. Okay. Maybe often I, I, this, need, this needs trusted nodes, yeah? often, that's true. Um, so if you want to distribute entanglement, so um, for uh, for like a fully, let's say, untrusted quantum internet, it's a different, it's a kind of a different story, but I I, keep, I still believe that there's going to be a connection, a, a, a hybrid situation between trusted and untrusted nodes. This is going to happen in the end. So. Well, maybe there's a misunderstanding with this quantum internet, no? A quantum internet will not replace the normal internet. And and I, I can safely say that 99.9% .9 of the people will never use a quantum internet. And I intended to say the same thing about QKD, actually. I don't believe in QKD as a, a, a technique for, for everybody, no? Uh, but they um, may use it without knowing it. I would put it that way. I think it may be a transparent technology that is actually going to be an underlying technology for many things that we do, like we do today, but not necessarily knowing it's quantum enhanced. Uh, this is my, my feeling. Yeah. You know, maybe still uh, a basic thing of QKD is you know, that the offices of Alice and Pop are secure. And I, I, I often mention that in my house, my, my, my twice people broke in, no? So m my house is not secure. So it's completely useless if I have a QKD device in my in my house to send a secret message to somewhere else because my house itself is not secure. So that's why I'm not a, a bit skeptical about uh, if it's really useful to have QKD for everybody because uh, Somebody will get your information. He can get it otherwise. The link is not not, not the link. So, so, so that's that's a very good point. I mean, of course, um, if you talk about security, you, you also need secure endpoints, right? And so, for critical infrastructure, I mean, if you talk about telecommunications backbone, gas, water, electricity, oil pipelines, right? Um, <laughs> that that is, is 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 a big thing, and and there also you can spend the extra money for securing the environment and so on. Um, however, what I see now, if you look at the uh, um, computer hardware and, 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 and this business, uh, I think people are also now thinking thinking differently because, I mean, now there comes up all the secure hardware, secure software and so on. And if you look in 10, 15 years from now, I think uh, things might have changed a little bit because, I mean, we were talking about Internet of Things before. Of course, I mean, these, these devices are horrible right now. They're a security nightmare, right? Um, and, and it can't go on like that because otherwise we have a problem. 
So people are working on that actively. I know in Europe there's big programs to do that with secure enclaves, secure chips, and so on, and secure operating systems. Um, so that I think it probably it will still not be you know in in every mobile phone to watch your cat videos or so, but um, but I mean you can understand that it will you know emerge more and more really near to the end customer. Yeah, may maybe a secure enclave in in your household where you know transactions at least can be you know certified or things like that. Um, and so in ten or fifteen years, I think things can can happen. Actually, if we would really come to this uh, quantum internet where we really would share entanglement over large distances, I mean, that's what I find so cute that then suddenly we really could secure uh, QKD even uh, with the Bell inequalities and so on. Because then, I mean, once we really can distribute entanglement, uh, then, I mean, there would need no problem to then directly implement the device independent QKD. So where you even do not have to trust uh, the producers of your hardware. I mean, that's that's really a cute uh, thing, yeah. just coming from the very foundations of quantum physics. It's uh, just a warning. I mean, a bit of an idealized view, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I mean, no, it, it is there. Once you have entanglement, you can do everything. I tell I, you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we have to be careful because there was some assumptions still left, even if the device independent. And it's important to to understand. But um, for sure, I mean, it will be much simpler right i mean again the the best assumption is basically the one that i don't have to make right so the fewer i, I have to make the uh, the better absolutely right and so so that will be of course will be an, an important tool for for things right absolutely mm -hmm. yeah. tatiana there's another question I, mean, uh, yes. I, I i believe that uh, actually people Normal people, no? they don't need cryptography. They would need a steganography because it's it's much more important that they can communicate each other without being noticed that they communicate. And this is important in in countries where you have minorities and they are suppressed, and they don't need cryptography, but they they would like to communicate. And well, cryptography maybe also a bit, of course, but there. Even if you can use QKD, you know, and your completely secure link, the mere fact that you communicate with an extremist for something, you have troubles. So if you want to guarantee democracy, you should guarantee that people can discuss without being noticed or can meet without being noticed. And today where we have this supervision with cameras and everybody knows where everybody is, it's really becoming a, uh, very hard, no? And uh, so I think to, to order that people need much more the, this freedom to discuss than to encrypt. That's uh, that's uh, less important. So I, well, I think a little bit more as you're having a very, very rich uh, quantum uh, cryptography toolbox where on, on top of being able to do encryption, you can also use quantum physics for doing a bunch of other super useful protocols. I agree with you, Hugo, but not to say that one is less useful than the other, I would say that um, this type of steganography or covert, I think, uh, communication, e-voting, all sorts of different protocols, we can name them, huh? well, but this is something that we, I think most all of us are very much interested in. Cryptographic protocols are different and for in different uh, situations. So I completely agree there is a world way, a very, very rich world uh, beyond quantum encryption. Yeah, but, but but we should be really as very sure. Basically, uh, you say people don't need encryption today, but I mean, we all use cryptography all the time. Each time your computer updates, you use cryptography, right? You use digital uh, yeah, sure. signatures and so on, right? And and so we should be as well. Uh, uh, QKD is uh, QKD keys will not be used only for uh, for for encryption, right? Authentication is, of course, the next obvious thing actually uh, to, to do, right? Message authentication, right? And so, so you can as well build some other cryptographic uh, 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 application to it. And then for the quantum internet as well, I mean, for sure there will be as well applications that go into the direction of privacy, right? Which come from the multi-party secure computation. They really can say, of course, more about that one as well, right? So, so that, that there are more use cases actually of, of, of counterpoint. Some of them are basically effectively reduced to QKD, 
if they can do QKDs and they can do all the other things. But others might as well then use future technology that basically it's looks similar to what we use in QKD and can use these technological building blocks for that, right? And so, so there's really a wealth of stuff. It, it's not only about just encryption itself. And, and this makes QKD a fantastic benchmark, right? A fantastic benchmark in this sense so that it's uh, yeah. super useful. Hugo, I'm surprised that you bring up steganography. I mean, it is a cryptographic method, isn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah sure. But and 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 I just thought that uh, I mean, given this flood of pictures uh, which uh, comes on the internet every day or something like this, if you use one of those platforms, I mean, there you could hide, I guess, tons of information already. Wouldn't this be even simpler nowadays than it was before? Yeah, but it's, it's not so easy to, uh, to hide information in a picture without being noticed, no? Is it? Okay. Because of the algorithms which are working or what? Uh, maybe we, we published a paper once on that, no? Where we use quantum noise in pictures in order to hide the information. And it, it's quite tricky, no? And uh, I think there is, beside this method which should be developed, no? Quantum steganography. Uh, uh, I think there is no secure uh, method around action. Okay. Good. Any more questions? Actually, uh, uh, Tatiana wrote something on authentication. Yes, I can read it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Whether authentication, because that's necessary for QKD, uh, shouldn't be simply. I mean, we need a key to make authentication. Then we could use the key for communication right away beforehand. But I, I mean, the the thing is that it's much more efficient. Does anybody know how, how efficient it is to produce new key in relation to the key what we need for authentication? I I, I mean, the amount of, of keys that we use for the initial authentication is really, really small, right? Uh, some hundreds or whatever things will, will completely do that one. And after that, you can really use here 10 or whatever megabit per second, draw it out there basically forever. Uh, and, and it, or denied it service attack kills it or whatever thing. Also, you can protect against that one as well. So, I mean, the thing is basically usually, uh, um, and that is as well a kind of practical cr as a problem that comes as well in cryptography. Cryptographers are worried about storing key as well. Right? So, if you have keys, then basically you, you, you're worried that basically someone might learn and compromise the key. So, if you store a large amount of data, how do you protect it? Uh, and maybe there, there's a difference basically how you work in QKD, you have the authentication. And basically, someone would actually need to actively break the authentication and, and keep doing it actively, interacting with the signal all the time to, to keep actually uh, to keep in the system. So there's some difference, but and that really should need, should really to be properly explored, right? And so so so, so that's something really uh, that we should work on. But it's basically it's not as easy as just say, oh, then I just do all this key stored and then I'm done. That will actually not work. Right? So, so the cryptographers would not like that idea. Right. And now there are more questions coming in. Uh, will QKD and quantum ever be necessary in that space in the space of blockchains? Uh, that is, uh, I, 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 I mean, uh, for sure, I think blockchains need to be actually be made uh, quantum secure, safe, right? That means they need to be safe, can't compute, otherwise this really will break down, right? You should not really have any blockchain technology that is not quantum safe, but typically people work there with, with post quantum. It's now the question basically, what if, is there a need for long-term uh, uh, protection in there? And uh, 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 I think that is basically the question. And it, it, that is the same thing, I think, like for additional signatures, always the question, do I need to be safe against today's uh, uh, attacks? Uh, or what, what happens if they change in the future? For example, if I do additional signature to protect something, they say, oh, it's really me. Then if it, uh, the signature cannot be broken today by, by, quantum, uh, by classic computer, and we don't have a quantum computer yet, then it's okay, I can basically uh, re-sign that message uh, just basically the day before the quantum computer go, goes full online and I can protect it again, which does not work for encryption, right? Uh, if, if I basically, I can record an uh, encrypted message and just at my leisure break it in 10 or 20 years whenever there's quantum computer is around. 
So uh, it's a more not exactly clear in which uh, uh, in which category is a blockchain which actually fall. That basically, if I can basically change my technology over in five or ten years to different actually to do that, I, I I don't know. I don't have the overview about that. I know someone who I could ask. <laughs> The last question is then on quantum networks and repeaters, whether we can just give a short you know, overview or something like this, just what it will be. And we don't say when it will be, okay. <laughs> Who wants to say what it will be? <laughs> Eleni, are you working on something like this as well? <laughs> It's, but I am, I am not working directly on quantum repeaters, but I have uh, like lots of our colleagues are working. Um, so um, I am working a bit on entanglement based stuff. Um, so um, what is the, the, the what is the vision of the future quantum networks? I guess uh, the idea would be well, it's linked to a bit of this trust uh, <laughs> business that we talked about, but it's even larger than this. It goes beyond cryptography, right? The idea is to create quantum networks to be able to connect quantum devices more globally. These quantum devices could be QKD systems, but are very far away, and in that case, you need somehow to connect them via some sort of relays or, or repeaters, but it could also be quantum computer, quantum sensors, it could be all sorts of processors, memories, um, to, to perform uh, advanced uh, quantum uh, quantum communication protocols that could even go in some cases beyond uh, cryptographic, um, uh, cryptographic applications. So what is my insight on the future technology of the field? I think one of the important uh, um, um, road, roadblocks right now is quantum memories and uh, there is a huge uh, effort in the community um, to build better uh, quantum memories to be able to store quantum states more efficiently having at the same time efficiency and good uh, and good fidelity of the quantum states and I guess another big challenge is that the quantum repeater uh, um, uh, uh, like technologies right now are have very 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 low rates so i guess it's another challenge it's not anything very practical for the moment so um so i think i mean there is lots of fundamental research and very exciting stuff to do in in this direction but uh, yeah i'm not going to attempt the timeline but i think um don't know in 10 years we can see some very very exciting stuff in this direction <laughs> yes we, we will have a lot of fun there as well i guess <laughs> until we get it yes <laughs> thanks a lot everybody time really was fast now uh and the beer is warm and no chance to to order a new one i would really like to welcome you soon sometime in yeah. munich <laughs> And then in a real pub, in a real brewery, then here with our beloved beer here. Thank you very much for joining us here. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. 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 everybody out there. Thanks.